Good morning and welcome to a special edition of This Week. We have picked ourselves up. We have fought our way back. Tears in triumph. Ruth Crowley. Grace in defeat. I pray that the president will be successful in guiding our nation. And a shocking resignation. This news is truly stunning. Did CIA Director David Petraeus' extramarital affair compromise classified intelligence? How will his departure scramble the president's national security team? And with Washington still divided after Tuesday's election, can the president and Congress find common ground on the fiscal cliff, immigration, and other big issues? We'll ask our headliners, the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Republican Saxby Chambliss, and the senator responsible for adding to the Democrats' majority, campaign chair Patty Murray. Plus analysis and debate of all the election fallout on our powerhouse roundtable with representatives Donna Edwards and Aaron Schock, Paul Jago of the Wall Street Journal, Katrina Vandenhuvel of The Nation, and Greta Van Susteren of Fox News. From ABC News, this week with George Stephanopoulos. And stand by for our powerhouse roundtable. So much to talk about. They are ready to weigh in on the Petraeus scandal, President Obama's second term, and a comeback strategy for the GOP. That all starts in just 90 seconds. This week with George Stephanopoulos. And we're back now with our powerhouse roundtable, joined by Greta Van Susteren of Fox News, Representatives Donna Edwards of Maryland, Aaron Schock of Illinois. I think you're still the youngest member. Still for of now. Congress, at least for now. <laughs> That's right. Katrina Vandenhoeffel of The Nation, Paul Jago of The Wall Street Journal. Let's talk about this big surprise that came out on Friday, General Petraeus having to resign. Uh, Greta, we heard from Pierre Thomas earlier and, and the Sen Senator Chambliss that this investigation seems to have played itself out. Where else does this go? Well, if he's called as a witness to testify before, um, Cap Senator Chambliss said that he might have to testify at some point on Capitol Hill. I'm an old-time criminal defense lawyer. When I heard this, and just to speak as old-time criminal defense lawyer, the thing I worried about is whether or not in any sort of investigation when he got the job, if he said anything that would be in any way jeopardize him at all criminally. That's worst-case scenario. Defense lawyers always freak out. That's why I asked worst. Senator Chambliss the question, because I, I, I thought that in the course of a background investigation to the CIA director, you might get a question uh, about... And, and, and remember what happened to Martha Stewart. She, she was investigated for insider trading, never charged with that. She was charged with lying to a federal officer. But we have no evidence that no, he was no, no, lying I'm not saying, I'm saying, as an old-time criminal defense lawyer, that's the first thing I worry about is the background check. That's where the red flag went up with me. You know, you hear Paul Chico, so many people saying now, oh, there might have been concerns, we might have thought about this, but this was so stunning to so many people. Sure, it was, because he's, uh, he, uh, I've gotten to know him professionally and a little bit socially over the years, and he's a very cautious man. I mean, he's very shrewd politically. He knew how to operate in Washington. So this uh, is a stunning, well, mistake in judgment. Uh, that I think surprised an awful lot of people and it's a loss for the country he's uh, he served his country salvaged the very well salvaged Iraq for the country by all accounts was doing a good job at the CIA now robs the president of one of his I think more seasoned advisors on national defense at a time when other people are leaving so uh, it, it's a real problem uh, that, that we're losing him but it's a lapse of judgment that's surprising and the Gmail account the private Gmail account that he apparently Pamela or Paula Broadwell had access to, I think, raises real security questions. It, it, it certainly does. And even General Petraeus has said, I think, in one of his rules for yeah. living, someone is always watching. But, you know, Senator Dianne Feinstein said at the start that she wished he hadn't resigned. She may have amended that. He had no choice, right? I think so, particularly coming out of the military as he did. That, this would have uh, been something that would, he would have cost his command in the military. And I think he didn't have any choice. Now, Katrina, I know that you don't agree with a lot of what... Uh, Paul's judgment well, I mean, on I think this General is a Petraeus personal. Career. I really think this is a personal matter. You know, it's a tragedy for the family. But uh, I do think, it, you know, it's kind of interesting to watch the coverage because there is such veneration for David Petra General Petraeus. You'd think that, you know, the worst thing the CIA has ever done is engage in an extramarital affair. I think General Petraeus was the architect of a failed counterinsurgency program. And I think um, that it's time for our media to pay little less attention to personal scandals and more to scandals uh, or concerns like that. And also the escalation of the drone war, which General Petraeus at the CIA made a big part of his portfolio. These are issues that Americans deserve to know more about, and we don't get as much so coverage. When you're talking about, about the failure, you're talking about Afghanistan or talking Iraq? talking about Iraq as well. I think there's a view that he because of the counter uh, the counterinsurgency but it was really bargaining with the sunnis i mean we can relitigate that history but it was bargaining with the sunnis and certainly the counterinsurgency 
in Afghanistan has not proven to be effective. And he's moved, he had moved before he resigned to counterterrorism, which we can argue, I think, is going to fuel a backlash, which is not going to make this country gave, more secure. He gave that statement, on, he went to Capitol Hill on September 14th and gave the video protest as the explanation for what happened in Benghazi, when two days earlier his station chief on the ground in Libya said uh, that it was, the, it was not the result of a protest. So you've got very inconsistent statements, so he's going to have to answer to those. He certainly will have to answer them. The other thing, one of the other interesting a twist here, Congressman Schock, it turns out, that an FBI whistle, whistleblower actually went to your number two in the House, right. Congressman Eric Cantor, and said he, there were concerns there that this was being covered up and wasn't being brought to the White House. Similar concerns have been raised by your colleague, Congressman Peter King. Do you have them? Well, I think we're going to find out more. I mean, right now it's all speculation. We don't know even when the affair began whether or not some of the questions he was asked during his vetting process uh, he may have been untruthful for. Uh, it's obviously a tragedy. I mean, he was well-respected by the Bush administration, rewarded by the Obama administration, um, and, uh, you know, it's going to make for a little more exciting lame duck season. Any concerns with how this is handled? Well, no. I mean, I think that uh, General Petraeus, um, you know, this is a personal flaw, and I think he was actually required to, uh, to resign. You can't have that kind of uh, infidelity come forward and um, raise you know, secu national security concerns and intelligence concerns. On the other, on the flip side, though, I do think that the CIA um, will have the capacity and will be able to respond to questions on Capitol Hill regarding Benghazi, and I think those are actually two very separate things, and we will get to the oversight on, on, on Benghazi and Libya uh, over these next several weeks, and then uh, General Petraeus will have a chance to put his life together separate and apart from his service. It could create complications for President Obama as he puts together his national security team, though. I want to put up a, a chart right now, Sean. We already know that Secretary of State Clinton was planning on leaving. Leon Panetta, Secretary of Defense, planning on leaving. You know the Secretary of Treasury is going as well. Perhaps the Attorney General and the White House Chief of Staff, Greta. Uh, this is one hole the President didn't expect to have. Well, in January. It, but yeah, of course he didn't expect to have it, but this is also quite a serious matter. I mean, this is the guy who's in charge of, of intelligence, and this was, an, as this was, if you look at Benghazi, this was an act of terrorism on 9-11. He's the most important person in our intelligence community, and everyone says, well, it's a personal problem, it's a personal problem. Well, the problem is it's a personal problem with someone who's extremely important, and we don't know to what extent it may have jeopardized or put, made him vulnerable. I'm not the least suspicious he did anything wrong vis-a-vis -vis the American country, uh, govern American people, but it is, it is not unreasonable to be very suspicious that we don't have all the information. You no, know, I think, listen, I think the relationship between President Obama and General Petraeus has been a rocky one. Don't forget that over at your network at Fox, he was your candidate for a while. I mean, he was going to be the Republican candidate. So I don't think I don't this think is always... That may have been a factor in why he was made CIA director. You know, you keep your foes close. But I also think that this, there are many people who could fill this hole, and I just wish that there is a different approach to foreign policy, a less militarized one that emphasizes political solutions and diplomacy. You probably maybe the president, though, not with General Petraeus. Go ahead, Paul. No, 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 the team. For, for the many journalists that are at our uh, news organization, we have very many world-renowned journalists, Jennifer Griffin, Catherine Harrods, and we say, your candidate over at your network. Let me just say that there are a lot of people who work really hard, and I think you're probably speaking for some of our conservative people, like yes, Sean Paul, as you go. There's also the question I think we need to find out. Is why? W when did the FBI really start to know about mm -hmm. this, and how high up Several did months, we Presumably, believe. the FBI director knew, presumably the attorney general knew, did they tell the White House Counsel's office? It's awfully convenient. And the judge who might have signed told, a warrant to get these records? Awfully convenient to be told on Tuesday at 5 p.m. of Election Day, which is the story now. It's just, it, 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 frankly, it doesn't pass the smell does, test. And, you know, that's we why I asked Senator Chambliss about that as well. He insists he was not told until Friday, but we do have this evidence that at least some whistleblower had come to Congressman Cantor before that. We have a lot more to talk about it. That's right, another member of Congress as well. Round, much, lots more roundtable coming up, more on the fiscal cliff. Who's got the upper hand there? Will there be a deal or deadline? that everyone pays for. Plus, President Obama sweeps the battlegrounds. Did Mitt Romney throw away a winning hand, or is it changing America moving away from the GOP? I have today ordered the Vietnam forces, which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. People have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. We did not repeat did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. The FEMA director is working 24 hours. 
the greatest hit. Every second term gets one. Greatest hits of the second term, according to Paul <laughs> Chico, right there. there. <laughs> How does President Obama avoid the second term? Of course, we're going to get into that in a little bit. But first, let's talk about the election. Katrina Van Den Heuvel, let me bring you in first from the nation. Uh, you know, a, a lot of polling showed the president was going to win this coming into the last day, but I think a lot of people were very surprised by how sweeping the victory was in the battleground states in the Electoral College. Well, I think you saw an ascendant coalition, the rising American electorate of Latinos, African Americans, women, working people. Um, and I think you also saw, George, an element of um, fairness, two visions competing. I, you're on your own, Jack, which is what Mitt Romney the 1% walking, talking, 1% put out there, and President Obama, who said, we're in this together. So you saw in Ohio, the most important state, President Obama, Sherrod Brown, now returned to the Senate, speaking to issues of fairness, speaking about the role of the auto industry rescue, the role of government. These are important issues. And then on the other side, you had a Republican Party, a discredited brand with a shrinking base, out of touch with the values that seem to be moving very quickly in this country. So, so when you talk about the Senate coalition, let me bring this to Paul as you go, was this a race that Mitt Romney could have won, or oh, sure. is democracy, democracy make it impossible? No, of course he could have won. I mean, he only lost by 100,000 votes in Ohio. He only lost by less than that in Florida, uh, if I believe the final 70,000 70, so. so th this was a lot closer than, than Katrina suggests that, uh, that, that, that it was. I think what you saw is that, what, a $100 million worth of unanswered ads, attack ads, from J May through July can do to an alternative candidate. Mitt Romney ran as a biographical candidate fundamentally. I'm a businessman who knows how to create jobs. What the Obama campaign did was systematically destroy that biography. And you saw that he never recovered from the summer. In the exit polls, it showed that Mitt Romney still had a net unfavorable rating, and he only broke even on he the He barely economy. got it up above into the positive range in the last 48 hours or so. Well, but in the, in the exit polls, it actually was a net unfavorable. So the, the electorate that turned out never really warmed at all to Mitt Romney. So I think this was more about a flawed messenger than a flawed message. There are problems with the, with the immigration position of the Republican Party. We can talk about that. But fundamentally, Mitt Romney never made the, never made the sale. And I was, there was one other thing that's stunning. You looked at the economy and the exit polls still blame George W. Bush for the economic problems. 53%. Fifty three percent of Mitt Romney never separated himself from George Bush. I wanna I wanna get I wanted to get to Greta, but one follow up right here. You talk about that period from April to August right. where Mitt Romney was outspent in all the battleground states. Some second guessing going on. Should he have reached into his own pocket and spent his own money there? Well, if he wanted to win, clearly they needed to respond somehow, and, and they didn't. And that was a strategic mistake by the campaign. He got beaten. You know, he just plain flat got out and he got beaten. He, they completely ignored the Hispanic uh, vote. Ne they never seemed to have any effort to bring the Hispanic vote into the tent. You know, that was a huge mistake, and he's feeling it. It was not such a huge margin, I don't think. Electorally, it was a huge margin, over 100 votes in the Electoral College, probably how about 120. That's a pretty big one. Yeah, oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, that's Nixon, huge. Carter, oh, oh, no, that's huge. But if you look at the popular vote across the country, it was not that big. The president clearly won. House got extra, Senate got extra, the Democratic Party won, but it was not such a huge resounding. You know, we have a, a lot of problems facing this country, the fiscal cliff being one of them that's going to be descending upon us. But the president won, Governor Romney's campaign uh, didn't do as good a job, and they certainly didn't uh, do anything about the Hispanic vote. One of the other big things the president's uh, team did, Congress, Congresswoman Edwards, is this organization throughout the battleground states. Not only did they get this ascent, the coalition of the Senate, but they made sure they made the most of every single voter out there. Well, they did. I mean, they had a huge uh, get out the vote operation, but that was turned on for a very long time. I mean, in really going after low propensity voters, making sure that you could actually pull together that coalition of women the president won, Latinos the president won, African Americans the president won. The president actually won the middle class, and I think it was actually a decisive uh, electoral college victory, and frankly, uh, the popular vote as well. I mean, when you look at Florida, the difference between, you know, a Bush win in Florida of 500. 37 votes and, a, and an a Obama win in Florida of 74,000 votes. It was a pretty decisive victory for Democrats uh, across the board, House and Senate. I mean, in, even in the House, we picked up, you know, seven, uh, seven seats, and uh, you know, so that's not enough to take the majority. But it's really pretty clear, that I think, that the, the public got the president's message. He got it across, and he got his vote. Congressman Schock, one group that, that the congresswoman left out, there was young people under 30. They also yeah. went heavily towards President Obama. You're a little bit over that right now. But what lesson does your party have to take away from all this? 
we got to do a better job with young people. We got to do a better job uh, with with women. But the the group that we really have to zero in on, I believe, is the Latino community, uh, a group that. Uh, really should be voting for Republicans to the degree we take a leadership role on the issue of immigration. And I think it makes sense for Republicans to get out front on immigration because it's a broken government program. And who better to fix a go broken government program than the Republican Party? It shouldn't take eight years on the average to figure out whether or not you qualify to become an American citizen. Uh, I think George W. Bush was trying to do that pre-September 11th. Uh, I, I think it's unfortunate that our party, when we controlled the entire process, didn't do more on the issue. I'm disappointed the president in his first four years, uh, despite a pledge to do so, didn't put forward a comprehensive immigration proposal. And I think the mandate that came out of this election after two billion dollars being spent, and we get the status quo, the mandate is to work together. We still have divided government, and the American people are expecting us to work I together. Think, I don't think this was, this was not a status quo election. This was a decisive win for a different set of values both the social values, the, immig the issues of immigration, of fairness, of dignity, but also of um, rebuilding a middle class that has been really hit hard in these last 30, 40 years. So that is not a status quo election in my mind. You would have thought that mind. would have gone, though, to, I mean, the economic, if the economic issue were the only issue, you would have thought that but it that wasn't would, the social no, values no, no, but I'm as just well, saying linked to the economic security. Because, uh, you know, the president had a tough argument to brag on the economy. He had a real tough argument this time. I mean, it was, it has not been vibrant, robust, or anything else. And that was what, that was what Governor Romney ran on. Obviously, the, obviously the voters were not particularly impressed. Well, but one well, of the things that might have been happening at the end, you have from September forward, consumer confidence going yes, up, right. home sales going up, you had good jobs numbers basically for the last six but months. He had a little bit of a wind at his back. But you've also got, but let's not forget the, the inner city, which everyone seems to ignore. Let's say the inner city in very tough times for a lot of people. If you look at the numbers that just came out last week on food stamps, food stamps, the last number is it, the most brief. Frequent, or recent number is August, went up about 421,000 people in the month of August for food stamps. But, We're now but, 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 the but I'm just saying did not lose the inner city. And nor did it No, no, but I'm saying is that, you know, that the economy in those areas, we have, everyone has completely ignored it. I, and in, no, the second no, term, I, in the second term, I think there will be a commitment out of this White House to pay attention to those issues. But, you know, it didn't help that the Republican Party traveled the country calling the president a food stamp president. Before we I get mean, that he has done more in his stim in the recovery program. There was or more any poverty funding than there had been since Lyndon Johnson's term, I want to pick exactly. up on something. Hold on a second. I want to pick up on something that, that Congressman Shocks was just talking about immigration because you've heard that Paul Jago from yeah. a chorus of Republicans since the election. Uh, was House Speaker John Boehner, Sean Hannity, saying he's evolved on the issue of Did immigration. Is he point at me? Is it William? Do I look like Sean Hannity point at me? We've got two questions. Will it happen now? And is that enough for the Republican Party? Is it simply fixing the immigration problem the key to the future? It's not the only thing they need to do, but I think it's, a, it's an important threshold issue for an awful lot of uh, not just Hispanic voters, but also uh, Asian voters. I mean, the, the Republican share of the Asian vote has shrunk from 42% in 2004, 33 percent in 2008, 26 percent this time. Now why in the world should Indian Americans or Chinese Americans vote so much less for Republicans now than eight years ago? What's the answer? Well I think the answer is they're, they're getting a message. They're getting a message that says you're really not welcome. I think part of that is the threshold question of immigration and the Republicans need to address that. If, if look, if, if the iceberg breaks up on immigration, the sort of on the, on the conservative part of the Republican coalition, there has been an, un, an unwillingness to consider immigration reform. It's just been closed off. So you saw Mitt Romney not be willing to address that and use words like self-deportation. A lot of us on the right have been pushing for immigration reform though, for a long time. I don't think though the Democrats have done a terrific amount in that area either. I went to that speech that President Obama gave at American University where he talked about what he's going to do with immigration. He had the House and the Senate and then nothing. But I you mean, know, you know, neither party has done anything I, and they're both in transit. They won't talk to each other. You know they what, won't do it. It's both these but, parties. But Greta, I agree with you to a point, but don't forget that it took the organi organization, the organizing of the dreamers to push President Obama to do what he did with executive action. And I think you're going to see more of that. And the Republican Party has been just closed off to any of those any voices. Voice. That's the when Democrats were in charge, when Democrats were in charge of the House, we in fact passed the Dream Act out of out of the House and could not break a filibuster in in the Senate to make sure that we could move but that to the president. Now wait a second now, because it was Republicans who stood in the way of that. And I don't think that getting the Latino and Hispanic vote is just about immigration. Yeah. It also is about a core set of values that believes in building uh, the middle 
class. This is what the president has committed to strengthening our, 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 our protections and opportunities for education. Hispanics get, care about those things. I want to get into that because we've talked about immigration, but of course the big immediate challenge facing both Democrats and Republicans now in Washington, the president, as well this fiscal cliff coming up uh, on December 31st, and also gets into the whole question of what the mandate of the election was. Let's hear from both the speaker and the president on that. If there's a mandate in yesterday's results, it's a mandate uh, for us to find a way to work together on the solutions to the challenges that we all face as a nation. On Tuesday night, we found out that the majority of Americans agree with my approach. And that includes Democrats, independents, and a lot of Republicans across the country. The president there was some tougher talk uh, than perhaps we saw before, but let me go to C Congressman Schock with this because you were echoing the words of the speaker that are saying the mandate is for people uh, to work together. A lot of reporting that uh, the speaker was um, very firm with members of your co conference this time around that he wants to make sure they fall in line behind his leadership uh, on getting a deal. What I'd like to press on is what does that mean uh, this time around? Is your conference ready to come forward with some revenues to make a deal work? Well, I think as you saw in the Bob Woodward book, uh, the evidence is out there. John Boehner extended a hand of revenue last time, nearly $800 billion of revenue, and the president walked away from the table of $800 billion, wanting over a trillion dollars in revenue. I think our conference stands ready behind our speaker on the issue of revenue, primarily through loophole elimination and deduction elimination, through, through tax reform. But what we really need from the president is leadership. We need from the president the other side of the ledger. He talked throughout his campaign about a balanced approach. He's talked about raising taxes on filers over $250,000. But the fact is, even if he gets what he wants, which is a tax increase on people over $250,000, that's $80 billion a year when we're running a trillion dollar deficit. So where the president needs to lead is put forward a budget, put forward a plan that deals with the major drivers of our debt. If he doesn't like the premium support program for Medicare, if he doesn't like some of our reforms to the drivers of debt, that's fine. But we can't negotiate with ourselves. And at this point, the House is the only one who has led on these issues. The president had some of those ideas in his last, in, in, in the ideas that he brought to the speaker. But one of the questions, Congresswoman, is will the Democratic caucus follow him on that? Well, I think that one of the things that the president has said, and we heard this last week, is that he really does want a balanced approach to this. He has put on the table a trillion dollars over 10 years with the, removing the uh, tax cuts for filers over uh, $250,000, and he ran on this. And so it's not like the American people didn't hear what he said during the election and aren't and aren't and, and Paul should go. The president does seem pretty determined. Uh, you know, and he had Jay Carney come out on Friday as well, yes. saying he's not going to sign. He would veto anything that extends uh, the tax tax rates right. for people over two hundred fifty thousand dollars i listened to all the leaders over the last several days and i know everyone's saying they want to work together i think the chances of america going off the cliff are at least thirty thirty five percent yeah i agree with you I, I do i mean if that was an olive branch i'd hate to see the stick that the president uh, offered he really made no concessions at all oh. and i think the problem that he has is above all we're talking like accountants here, all right, and balancing the budget. What he needs above all is growth, economic growth, faster growth, three to four percent growth. That's what carried Reagan and Clinton in their and, second and terms. And I, I agree with Paul Gigo. Americans voted decisively for fair share taxes on the richest, for protecting Social Security, Medicare, but also for growth and investment. You cannot get growth and investment with the spending cuts as they are laid out in the grand bargain. And certainly not the sequester. And certainly not the sequester. So I think. Part of the problem we're having, George, is the fundamental assumptions overriding this entire discussion. Senator Murray said that we have a big debt and deficit problem. No, we don't. We have a big public investment and jobs no, problem. We do. No, we, we do. No, and we are not, we are not, but let me just last point. We are not Greece. Wait a second. Austerity, if you believe in evidence-based politics and economics, you look at what is going on in Europe, and austerity, which we may have American style in this country if we proceed the way we are doing, has led to economic pain, has led to no, wait, killing wait, growth, wait, killing wait, growth, wait, and, and debt turn and on deficits. My turn on this. And you know what I don't understand? How the American people have let all these members of Congress, the Senate, and the President off the hook. This now, we're now going to go off the fiscal cliff? No, it's not a now. We've known about this since at least July of last year. And all they've done is absolutely nothing. Nothing, the, was gonna, nothing could get done that, but you know what, that's, yes, It's of not course, possible. But that's the deplorable thing, is that we all sort of say, well, that's the way it is. Nothing ever gets done. You know, the American I'm surprised at the American people. Everyone knows about this, but the whole government's been on
on stall. Nothing has been done. They've well, known about right. it. And that we're supposed to say, well, that's the way it is. That's the way it's always done. Now we've got this fiscal cliff where a lot of American people Which are really going to get hurt. That's the best hurt. way to get action. That's right. To yes, well, and Greta, I think, I think that what the president has laid out, I think he's been very reasonable. He said, you know what? We do need uh, balance. We'll remove those uh, tax breaks for the wealthiest. We'll make investments that we need to in infrastructure, in education, mm -hmm. in research and development, the things that are actually going to make us competitive and actually contribute to the growth that we all, that all, that all of that us, that needs. all of us want. And I think that it's incumbent now for uh, a slimmer Republican majority in the in the House, uh, a slimmer, uh, a, a larger majority in the Senate, and the President to actually come together where we can. We all actually agree that we need to keep those tax cuts for people making up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Let's here's, just pass that and do it. Part of the question it. for you, Congressman Shock. If you know, I think. There's some bipartisan agreement that closing loopholes would be a way to go. We way to go to raise revenue. The problem has been the math mm. of that. That you can't get enough to actually fill the hole um, by simply closing loopholes and deductions for the wealthy. Well, I'm glad you bring up math because uh, once again we've heard about you know the president's plan to raise taxes on wealthy individuals as a as a means to deal with our debt crisis. But the reality is the math doesn't add up. We can't tax our way out of debt. Okay, that's the fact. So whether we have to deliver a calculator to the White House in order to get a budget from him that works, if, if, I'm not willing to go along with the straight-up tax increase that the president wants, okay? But even if he gets what he wants, if, that, if he's going to lay out a balanced approach, it needs to be balanced. Okay, Mr. President, you want to raise taxes by $100 billion a year or a $1 trillion over 10 years. We're running a trillion dollar deficit every year. The reason why you don't, you, you don't have a lot of optimism coming out of the Republican conference is we've been out there leading with our chin the last two years on a budget. The president has criticized us left and right over our proposals and given us no countervailing Leader proposals. Number one. Strikes me in the exit polls. How about strikes? Waste and, the waste, the thing, sure. Neither party is talking about waste. I mean, yeah, they, you're yeah, talking about, no, they aren't. They're no, not going to say so so waste. Is a Everybody small. wants to talk about it's waste. It's, 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 a, it's what, part of the what, culture. What strikes me is if you look at the exit polls, voters, majority of voters, didn't say deficits were their main concern. It was about jobs and growth. You can, and you can't cut your way to growth. So you can't I can't tax your way to growth either. But you know, tax a tax cut has never built a bridge or helped with the deteriorating infrastructure of this country. I think you put people to work, and my proposal is you don't let spending cuts kick in until you have unemployment of five to six percent. Then you have a healthy country growing, and then you turn to the issue of recovery of debt and deficits. I think, though, more important is the president needs to go out to the country and speak to those voters who said that their main priority was growth and jobs. And I think and how he does this will set the tone for his like second the administration. Got the, got the Expose message, the Republican. That's why he was out the way he was out on Friday. I want to get to one more issue before we take a break. Kind of remarkable evolution on social issues in this election as well. We saw three states pass uh, referendums on gay marriage, legalizing uh, gay marriage. Also, both Colorado and Washington legalizing recreational uh, use uh, of marijuana. And Congressman Edwards, let me begin with you. Uh, first, we still have a red-blue divide on gay marriage, but this was significant. Your home state of Maryland. Well, that's right. I mean, my home state of Maryland actually passed our Marriage Equality Act, and it passed by, you know, a narrow margin, but it means that we've come, you know, quite a distance. We also passed the DREAM Act in, in Maryland as well. And so, I mean, I think that what you're seeing is an evolution across the board, and people are saying, you know what, we actually don't need the government in the middle of our bedrooms uh, deciding what it is that we do, and we need to end discrimination across the board. And so whether you're, you know, gay or straight, in, in Maryland at least, you'll have the ability to get... Uh, to get married. Is this healthy, healthy development having these initiatives? I, I think it is because I think what you're doing is you're seeing really very contentious cultural issues where we have this divide, as you said, being settled democratically. That is at the ballot box through a process through which both sides have to accept because that's the way we do things in this country. And I think letting that play out in the states as opposed to some kind of judicial in position from above is the way to handle this over time. I wonder if time. this is going to make, you're a lawyer, Greg, I wonder if this is going to make the Supreme Court more or less likely to take on the issue of gay marriage this term. Well, what's, what's so significant about this is that it wasn't a legislature. This was the people of the state speaking. That's what's so dramatically different than any of the state legislature. This is a big difference in what we have. These are the people in their states, in states' rights, and they've made the decision. I think the more interesting is the marijuana because that conflicts with federal law. And what you know, and I don't know how they're going to reconcile that. The Supreme Court is going to have to. The Attorney General that. has been silent I, on that so well, far. They don't want to talk I'm about hoping, it. I'm hoping that the President and the Attorney General use this opportunity of to ratchet down the drug war. 
which would really disproportionately benefit Latinos and African Americans. And after all, it's what the, the three last presidents of this country did when they were young, recreational use of marijuana. They didn't inhale. They didn't inhale. <laughs> but, um, but I think it is, as Donna said, I think you're seeing an astonishing and transformation <laughs> of to, you know, the tolerance and the social values and the idea that pe young people especially don't want government in their bedrooms. If I put one proposition I find really interesting is the one in California is showing that the kind of anti-tax hysteria has abated. I think yeah. that was well. an important one for the future. Good luck, California. Well, quickly, Paul, what what should the Justice Department do now on these issues in Colorado and Washington? Should they enforce federal law or let well, it go? Well, I, I think if I look at Supreme Court precedents, I think that they will be overturned. I mean, the, 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 it just conflicts with federal law, and it claims, seems to me that... So did uh, Arizona with the immigration. I mean, they've got well, also... Then they, and they overturned uh, some, of, some of that, too. So I, th I, th I don't think this will hold up, under, at least under current Supreme Court precedent. Okay, thank you all very much. One more round to go. Which candidates are already making their move for 2016? The roundtable weighs in on that. This week with George Stephanopoulos. Brought to you by Charles Schwab. Already there's a new survey that says Hillary Clinton is favored to win the Iowa caucuses in 2016. <laughs> I think they could have at least waited until we peeled the I voted stickers off of our jackets. But. So to summarize, a woman who has not yet expressed any interest in running is well ahead of some other people who aren't running. Good study. <laughs> I guess it's never too early. Lighthearted lightning round right now. Congressman Schock, who are you look? Who are you going to be watching most closely the next four years? And where are you on the Hillary versus Biden 2016? Well, uh, first I'd say anybody who travels to Iowa that doesn't represent Iowa uh, is self-identifying themselves as a potential candidate. I think Marco Rubio, who's headed there, is, is uh, leading the pack. Marco Rubio, Paul Ryan, certainly, is the VP nominee. Uh, you guys got, like, Bobby Jindal. Uh, certainly, if Chris Christie wins re-election, uh, he'd be in that pack. Uh, Biden versus Hillary? Um, I'd have to have my money on Hillary. I don't think Biden did himself any favor in the VP debate. I don't know. I'm a Biden fan. I'm a Hillary fan. And I'm just going to wait, you know, at least for a little while. And I will wait to peel my uh, I voted sticker off. <laughs> okay, great. I think you should keep your eye on Governor Susana Martinez out of New, New Mexico. Mexico. She's a Republican in a Democratic state. She um, handled their deficit problem. Um, she was against, uh, she came out against uh, something that Governor Romney said, the self deportation. And so she was sort of on a, outs a little bit with some Republicans. But I would keep my eye on her over uh, Senator Rubio because she's a governor. Speaking as a journalist, I'm a Biden man. Uh, I, I, like, uh, I, like, uh, I like I like Joe provides great copy. Uh, on the Republican side, uh, I think that if George Jeb Bush runs, I think he has to have to be the favorite. Last word, Katrina. Uh, quickly. For those of us with election fatigue, could we just start doing some governing? <laughs> there we go. A good plea to end on. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Fantastic roundtable. Congressman Shocks going to be answering the questions you have on Twitter. Look for that on abcnews.com slash this week later today. And now on this Veterans Day, we honor our fellow Americans who serve and sacrifice. This week, the Pentagon released the names of four soldiers killed in Afghanistan. And when we come back, election night predictions, which of you got it right?